Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the webinar on Understanding and Managing Soil Biology for Soil Health and Crop Production. This webinar is the final presentation in a series of nine webinars about soil health and organic farming organized by the Organic Farming Research Foundation and eOrganic with funding from the Clarence Heller Foundation. I'm your host, Alice Formiga of eOrganic. eOrganic has many articles, videos, and webinars about organic farming and research, and you can find all of them by typing webinars by eOrganic into a search engine. Um, so I'd like to welcome back the presenters of all the webinars in this series, Mark Schoenbeck. Mark is a research associate at the Organic Farming Research Foundation, and he's worked for 31 years as a researcher, consultant, and educator in sustainable and organic agriculture. So Mark, I'm going to hand over the remote control to you. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're talking about soil life, uh, which is a favorite topic among organic farmers. This became pretty clear in the survey that um, Organic Farming Research Foundation conducted in 2015 in preparation for their 2016 National Organic Research Agenda. Uh, they found that not only did 74% of respondents to this nationwide survey, it's a, out of more than a thousand farmers, rated soil health as a high research priority and it was the most often cited priority. Um, a lot of them made comments about wanting to learn more about what soil life or soil microbes need to thrive and the roles of different organisms or of the soil uh, biota as a whole in crop nutrition, crop health. Uh, a lot of them interested in uh, mycorrhizal fungi and other bi uh, plant symbionts. Uh, some questions about uh, these applied um, microbial products, are they really helpful, are they really needed, or are they kind of snake oils? Uh, a lot of really good questions around that. And um, nematodes and insect pests, uh, which can occur in the soil as do their natural enemies and soil-borne diseases. So before we uh, get into the details of how organic practices may or may not, or how they can be best uh, tuned to uh, optimize your soil food web, I'm just going to take a quick tour through the uh, soil food web, at, web itself and describe some of the major groups of organisms and what they do in the soil. Um, this is a diagram of the soil food web showing all the different trophic levels. Um, this is um, something developed by Dr. Elaine Ingham, uh, Ingham uh, back in about 2000 and it became part of the soil biology primer and it's a diagram that's turned up in many places in many contexts. Uh, she introduced this concept during the 1990s, um, and it was the first time that this, <clears throat> the importance of soil life in plant nutrition and in other important aspects of agriculture became really widely known. So you have initially, you have the plants themselves uh, converting sunlight into organic and CO2 into organic matter. And then the plants and their residues become food for the decomposers or second trophic level in this diagram, the bacteria, fungi. And there's certain nematodes that uh, kind of jump the gun and feed directly on the plant roots. We'll talk about uh, those characters a little bit more a little later on. <clears throat> and then the next level, the organisms that graze on these microbes, um, nematodes and some small arthropods and then their predators and so on up until we get to the, the big critters that we see and sometimes have to chase out of the garden. So we'll start at the beginning, bacteria. And there's this other interesting group called archaea. They used to be called bacteria, archaeobacteria. Um, some recent DNA analysis show that they archaea, although they look like bacteria, they're about as related to bacteria as they are to, our, to uh, humans and other mammals. So that's a very interesting discovery. Uh, they do make up about 10% of the soil biomass. Um, <clears throat> well, let's look at first at the bacteria themselves. Uh, a lot of them play this role of decomposers. They break down the organic residues that nature and the farmer return to the soil. Uh, there are some root zone or rhizosphere bacteria that play very important symbiotic roles of different sorts, including nitrogen fixers. Uh, there's some other bacteria that uh, are involved in mineralization and nitrification, uh, with, uh, mostly the nitrification, turning ammonium nitrogen into nitrate, which is the form that some plants prefer. 
Uh, some plants can use either one equally well. Uh, this is another interesting group of bacteria in the soil is they are the gut microbiomes of larger animals in the soil, everything from microarthropods and some of the nematodes up to the earthworms and of course mammals. And as you've probably learned by now, we all have our own gut mi microbiome without which we couldn't live. And yeah, there are a few bad uh, character, bad actors in the bacterial uh, kingdom, a few plant pathogens. Um, here's an example. Uh, there are bacteria, of course, in these uh, nodules in the legume. And then here's a plant root. And you can see the root hairs coming out here and then the root sloughing at the tip, which is normal as it grows through the soil. Um, and there's just a gazillion bacteria, just a bloom of bacteria right in this nutrient-rich zone. The plant is feeding those bacteria. Uh, one thing I want to say is I want to credit Dr. Elaine Ingham and her uh, colleagues and also Dr. Ray Weil and Niall C. Brady for their most recent um, edition of Nature and Property of Soils on which a lot of this initial material is based uh, on this uh, soil food web uh, tour. And the soil archaea are very interesting. They play very um, uh, specialized roles. The archaea were first discovered in extreme environments wow, there's life in this frozen glacier or there's life in this 250 degrees subsea uh, steam vent. And they were found to be these archaea. But then in the soil, um, a lot of them are involved in this nitrification process and also denitrification. Some of them are methanogens, um, which are a bit of a problem from the viewpoint of uh, trying to manage uh, climate change because they're forming methane when the soil is uh, anaerobic. But they are all those that play important roles in plant nutrition. They're sulfur oxidizers, turning um, inaccessible forms of sulfur into sulfate sulfur, which is um, what the plants utilize. Um, there are also some archaea that convert <clears throat> certain micronutrients from an unavailable to a more available form, or sometimes from an excessively available and toxic form into a less available and therefore more balanced. So they play a lot of important roles. Okay, actinobacteria. Uh, these are sometimes called actinomycetes. They were once thought to be fungi and they're really bacteria, but they form filaments and, and the filaments can get dense enough and tangled enough that you can see them with the naked eye. Yeah, that white powder in, in compost and that often forms on difficult to decompose materials like um, uh, wood chips uh, and uh, chip brush, uh, those are actually actinobacteria. One thing I wanted to mention about the regular bacteria, I forgot to say this, um, they do tend to feed mostly on the highly available organic materials like the sugars and the proteins and the amino acids and the fatty acids that are in uh, organic residues and in the root exudates. That's why they like root exudates that hang out close to plants. Um, they're bodies tend to be nutrient rich and very high in nitrogen, low carbon to nitrogen ratio. So in that initial bacterial bloom after organic residues are added to soil can tie up soil nitrogen for a time. And that can be a short term disadvantage when you're trying to grow crops and they need nitrogen as well. They compete with the bacteria. It also has the advantage of preventing all of that manure nitrogen, for instance, or green manure nitrogen from a legume from simply leaching out and uh, polluting the groundwater and being lost to crop production. Um, and we'll see how very soon that uh, nitrogen gets returned to the, the crop. So in the actinobacteria, we have something that is a lot like bacteria in that they prefer neutral soils, um, not very acidic, but on the other hand, they're more able to digest woody materials. So if you go and spread wood chip mulch on a you know, vegetable uh, crop, uh, there will be these actinobacteria that'll help break that down and convert it to soil organic matter. A lot of them are plant root symbionts. Uh, there's some nitrogen fixing actinobacteria in a genus called Frankia. They're important to certain shrubs and trees like alders. Um, and they're as important to these woody plants as rhizobia are to legumes in nitrogen fixation. The rhizobia, of course, are true bacteria. A lot of path, um, actinobacteria are antagonistic to pathogens, largely by forming antibiotics. There are a few plant pathogens like common scab of potato, which is a fairly serious problem. Um, actinobacteria generally like moist, moist soil or moist compost, but some of them are very tolerant to dry conditions or heat or saline conditions, so they will continue to maintain biological activity during a dry spell or in low rainfall regions. 
um, and they're also play a role in continuing the breakdown of uh, compost starting materials into compost when the pile gets fairly hot. <clears throat> Fungi are extremely important in the soil food web. Uh, they're the decomposers. They're really good at digesting woody materials. And fungi are more effective at building stable organic matter than bacteria per se. Uh, and in an ideal, in really well-managed agricultural soils, you have a balance of fungi and bacteria, equal amounts of both, because you really need both functions, as we'll see soon. Um, they're the root symbiotic bacteria, ectomycorrhizal fungi and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, this is an example of ectomycorrhizae that are forming around roots to form a visible mass. Uh, these are some decomposer uh, uh, fungi. <clears throat> now, these root symbionts, these mycorrhizae, are extremely important. They're one of the most central players in the soil uh, microbiome in terms of uh, plant production and soil health. Uh, in fact, there's now fossil evidence that land plants and mycorrhizal fungi evolved together. They came on the land together because, remember, there wasn't any soil back in those days as we know it. There was dirt, there was rocks, and there was bits of clay and silt and sand all ground up, but it was dead until these plants and their fungal symbionts got to work on it. Yeah, there's some really bad plant pathogens in the fun fungal kingdom, and there are some uh, good allies to help fight those pathogens and even uh, some larger pests like insects. And those are the biofungicides and biopesticides, some of which are commercially available to organic producers. Protozoa, they don't make up as much of the soil biomass as the fungi or the bacteria or the earthworms. Uh, protozoa are typically a few hundred pounds per acre at most, whereas um, each of those other categories could be a ton of live weight or more per acre. So they are important though, because what happens is the protozoa feed primarily on bacteria. And it doesn't take as much nitrogen to build a milligram of protozoa as it does to build a milligram of bacteria. So when they get all this excess nitrogen, they release it into the soil as ammonium nitrogen. And um, when you have the bacterial bloom near the near the plant root, then the protozoa say, oh, that's where the food is. So they go into the plant root zone as well. So they're releasing a lot of those nutrients right close to the plant. Um, one thing we've seen about, uh, has been known about protozoa is that the ciliates um, are prevalent in really wet soils and high levels of ciliates can indicate an uh, inadequate drainage perhaps or an imbalance in terms of soil moisture. Uh, flagellates are more common in drier soils, uh, although they'll need some moisture to be able to move around. Uh, nematodes, okay, uh, nematodes are a very interesting and complex uh, phylum of soil life. Um, you say nematodes and some farmers kind of shudder because you got these um, root feeders. And if there's too many root feeders, they become a really bad pest. You can really make a mess of your crop. Uh, they're also bacterial feeders and fungal feeders. They feed on those other microorganisms. And when they do that, they also don't need as concentrated a nutrient as a bacterial or fungal cell provides. So when they do that, they're releasing crop nutrients. Uh, you also have some larger uh, nematodes that are predators or omnivores. Uh, they'll help keep the root feeder numbers down. Um, you also have these interesting ones that are called entomopathogenic. They're parasites. They go into um, uh, the larvae of insects in soil and commonly attack insect pests like caterpillars or um, like cutworms, or they'll also attack certain beetle larvae like Japanese beetles. And they get in there and their gut microbiome, which is good for the nematode, comes out and it's terrible for the for the insect, it's what really kills the insect. So that's why they're called entomopathogenic. They're a vector for that pathogen. And they're so effective that of course, you know that uh, the steinernema and the heterorhabditis have been developed as biopesticides. Microarthropods, these are getting now into the borderline of macroscopic organisms. Yeah, you can also, if you look real carefully, you can barely pick out some of the larger predatory nematodes. These guys also, they're in the neighborhood of about a quarter of a millimeter up to a millimeter long. There are some six-leggers, which are called spring tailors or columbola. They're sometimes considered true insects or at least closely related. And then there are the mites that are eight-legged. They're more related to ticks and, and uh, spider mites than insects. 
but these are all very beneficial. They physically shred up some of the coarser um, plant and animal residues, organic residues that are dropped on or in the soil. And by shredding it up, they make it more available to bacteria and fungi, and they, they accelerate the breakdown and uh, release of nutrients. Some of the mites are also predators. Uh, and some of the columbola uh, will also be grazers directly on the fungi and bacteria. <clears throat> Earthworms, um, everybody is very familiar with these and it's the one way that it's very easy for a farmer to assess the soil life in the soil, dig up a couple of shovelfuls. You hope to see at least a few earthworms therein. Um, they've been called ecosystem engineers because they really physically change the environment and they're constantly creating and modifying habitat. Uh, they build macropores in some of the earthworm species that go down deep. They build deep channels that allow moisture to soak in more quickly, really enhance drainage. They also take, what they, earthworms do is they eat soil and residues wholesale. There's everything in their path. And they have a, uh, they have a very vibrant mut, uh, gut microbiome, um, which is essential, again, to their capacity to digest the organic materials. And what happens is all the mineral soil and whatever organic materials they don't assimilate and all these, uh, some of their own gut microbiomes get mixed together and they create this enriched aggregated material called worm casts. Now this is a, a type of earthworm is very common. It's called the European night crawler. If you see those six and eight inch long earthworms that you say, wow, I've got earthworms. It's usually this guy. Um, they cast on the surface and they make those deep channels uh, there are other earthworms that live just in the near the surface of the soil and they go um, what make horizontal burrows or there's some that just live in organic residues, including the red wiggler, um, which is uh, Isenia fetida that's important for, um, uh, for the uh, create um, vermicomposting uses that organism. Uh, and it also occurs in nature. You'll find it, you know, just in compost piles coming in or in, in uh, leaf litter in the forest. Now, the reason these are, critters are called egg ecosystem engineers is that when you have a high earthworm population, you can turn over anywhere from about nine to 450 tons of soil per acre per year. That soil goes through the earthworm and gets uh, excreted in this form, either at the surface or through the soil profile. And they also can help mineralize 45 to 80 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year. When I wanted to add another thing about those nematodes I mentioned earlier, the ones that feed on the microbes, they can contribute 30 to 40% of the annual nitrogen mineralization. So you can see how between the earthworms and the nematodes in a very healthy cropland soil or a prairie soil where these critters tend to be numerous, uh, you can get a lot of your plant available nitrogen just through this turnover of organic matter by the soil life. Uh, when you look at this 450 tons, that's equivalent to like three or four inches of soil. That's probably an extreme. But even if you're looking at, you know, nine tons, that's a significant amount. It's like a little bit of biotillage going on all the time. <clears throat> some other soil macrofauna in some of the tropical areas, termites kind of take the ecological niche of earthworms. They are the ecosystem engineers and they can get a little out of hand when they build these great big termite mounds like three or four feet high. But in natural ecosystems, those then become the most fertile soil in the savanna or the forest where these are occurring. Um, ants are also important macroorganisms for doing some of this uh, bulk soil and residue mixing in many forest and grassland soils, uh, temperate and tropical. These critters are really interesting, dung beetles. They play a vital role in pasture and grazing lands because they either make balls of dung and take them down to bury them to feed their young, or they simply come into the cow pat or the horse dropping and just sort of consume it from below. And as they basically dispose of all this surface accumulation of dung, they not only help cycle nutrients, but they break up the parasite life cycles. And I'm talking about parasites that are gonna bug our livestock or our wildlife. And they also reduce food safety risks. I mean, if you have, you know, suppose a cow comes through and poops on the field that you're gonna to wanna to harvest lettuce from in two months. Um, if the dung beetles dispose of it, there's a much smaller chance of any foodborne pathogen getting from that manure into your crop. So I'll talk a bit more about how soil life functions in relation to plant nutrition, crop protection, 
um, and uh, organic production practices. So this is one of the earliest uh, kind of principles of organic agriculture ever since I first heard about organics in high school. It was like feed the soil, then let the soil feed the plant. And there's a related uh, concept called um, law of return that uh, Sir Albert Howard, who's one of the early pioneers of organic agriculture in the mid 20th century, what he was basically saying is it's not enough to just put mineral fertilizer salts on the soil, which was becoming all the rage in those days, just beginning to become the new technology. Said, You've got to return the manure. You've got to get crop residues. And it's good to compost it to stabilize the nutrients. So those are some of the early concepts. So what are we feeding? Actually, not only is soil life do all those wonderful things I've described so far, but basically it's the processing center of all organic residues that come into the soil, all organic materials, whether it's dung or dead crop residues or the exudates from living plant roots, it all, or something called active organic matter. This is organic matter that's already undergone some processing by this soil life, but is still available. It still can be food for other organisms. So it all goes through this soil food web. And then eventually what comes out is about half of it, maybe a little more, a little half, gets respired into CO2. So yes, all that wonderful carbon that came in, it's going back to the atmosphere, which already has a little too much CO2, but plants are gonna start taking it up, they need it. And the other important thing about mineralization, which is this process, um, is that it releases plant nutrients. All this has, all these materials that are coming in represent plant nutrients that are, for the moment, tied up. But then as this respiration and mineralization occurs, the nutrients become available to the plant again. So that closes that nutrient cycle. The other valuable function, really important, is called stabilization. And that's the formation of stable organic matter. And the definitions vary, but we can just, for the sake of this presentation, say, any organic matter is going to stick around longer than a decade, we can call it stable uh, because it'll tend to accrue in the soil rather than break down as active organic matter does. So we want both of these processes going on, mineralization to feed our next crop and maintain fertility, stabilization to maintain soil health and maintain tilth. I'll show you how that happens shortly. And also it's very important for carbon sequestration. The reason this cycle doesn't just sort of you know, get us back to square one by making CO2 is that half of that carbon in a really healthy soil eventually ends up here. So how do we monitor all this? Um, I'm not gonna get much into monitoring because we don't have time to cover all the bases. Uh, this is a challenge. How do you really keep track of what your soil life is doing? However, there have been two fairly simple laboratory procedures developed in recent years, over the last 10, 20 years, to reflect these two vital processes. One of them is you simply take a soil sample and uh, enclose it in an airtight container with a carbon dioxide trap and let it respire at about room temperature for four days. You make sure the soil is at optimum moisture level for soil biology. And you say, well, how much is it? how much activity is there. That activity will be measured as its respiration. And that's what's called PMC or uh, potentially mineralizable carbon. I should have spelled that, I'm sorry. Potentially, potentially mineralizable carbon. And that's just estimated by how much CO2 is formed by keeping soil in an enclosed place for four days. Um, and then stabilization there's actually a form of active organic matter called permanganate oxidizable carbon. And that is measured by mixing your soil with a dilute solution, it's 0.02 molar for those of you who are interested in scientific details, but it's a fairly dilute solution of this potassium permanganate. Now this is a very deeply colored compound, so uh, even your dilute solution is gonna have to look like uh, a dark wine. And then the more uh, of this, permanganate oxidizable carbon is present, the more that color will diminish and you can then measure that very precisely. Surprisingly, even though this is a form of active organic matter, this is highly correlated with the microbial processes that lead to stabilization. So it's been a really good index of that ability of the soil life to build up that stable organic matter. So it's all a matter of balance, as I mentioned. And, um, 
one thing I want to point out is that overall process of turning organic residues into either organic matter or carbon dioxide, there is a first step. And really, the first thing that happens is whatever the microbes eat either becomes CO2 and plant nutrients or more microbes. And of course, the microbial biomass doesn't build up exponentially forever, so because they're dying off as well. And it's that die off that eventually leads to the formation of um, stable organic matter, also contributes to the active organic matter. But in any case, there are two important uh, parameters that scientists use to evaluate this balance. One is called microbial growth efficiency. That means when these microbes eat a meal of organic residues from all these sources here, uh, how much of it becomes more microbial biomass and how much of it is respired as CO2 uh, with release of nutrients? So uh, that can be new biomass divided by your inputs. So if you're getting seven pounds dry weight of organisms, new organisms out of 10 pounds this, you have a really high growth efficiency. Whereas if you're only getting two pounds out of 10 pounds, this is fairly low. There's another one called metabolic quotient called QCO2. And that's the ratio of the respiration to the existing biomass. And what that means is basically how hard, how hard does this stuff have to work just to maintain itself through respiration? Turns out this is an index of stress on the soil microbiome. So uh, factors that tend to build biomass and stable soil organic matter, in other words, to give you a high microbial biomass efficiency and a relatively low uh, re uh, metabolic quotient or QCO2. Um, one thing to remember is that fungi tend to have a higher uh, microbial growth efficiency than bacteria. Uh, and that's the reason why you want both bacteria and fungi in your agricultural soil. So you got the bacteria helping with nutrient release and you got the fungi helping with building soil organic matter and structure. But these are some of the practices that help. First is to balance your carbon and your nitrogen. You see a cover crop here. It's a nice thick cover crop. And there's triticale, which is a cereal grain, very high in carbon, especially at this uh, heading out stage. And then there's Austrian winter field pea, which is fixing nitrogen like crazy, especially when it's got the triticale, it's sucking up the nitrogen as soon as it's formed. So that you've got maximized nitrogen fixation and a lot of nitrogen rich tissue. But you have this balance. Um, and then finished compost itself has a lot of stable organic matter and it interacts with the microbiome and these fresh crop residues to further enhance the capacity to grow new microbial biomass and eventually that stable organic matter. A lot of that stable organic matter basically consists of microbial remains. You know, when, the, when a given microbial cell dies at the end of its life cycle, its remains will adsorb to silts and clays and other soil minerals. And that is a major way that stable organic matter is built up. The second way is that you do have some accumulation of uh, organic matter protected in aggregates, which are formed again through this whole process. So anyway, another thing is reducing tillage, using a roll crimper to terminate the cover crop, and then planting your, your main crop no-till uh, whenever that's practical, uh, or even just simply reducing this intensity of tillage will help enhance this process. So we wanna promote mineralization in circumstance, certain circumstances. You have a really heavy feeding crop, if you plow down a green manure, the tillage will stimulate bacterial activity, will tend to increase respiration and mineralization and somewhat decrease new, uh, uh, at least the new formation of stable organic matter. You actually get a bloom of new microbial biomass, but it tends to be organisms that will, will also hasten the uh, breakdown and release of nutrients. High concentrated fertilizers. These are some organic examples of relatively concentrated nutrient sources. Blood meal, poultry litter, um, those high nutrient analyses will tend to stimulate this mineralization process. And also, you notice this is just hairy vetch. It's an all legume green manure, it's, so it's a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, and yes, that'll promote the mineralization. So sometimes things get out of whack. You till too much, not only are you losing soil to the wind and the rain, 
um, but you're really stressing the soil microbiome. If you have a prolonged fallow where there's nothing but a little bit of crop residue left, you're not growing an active cover crop, you don't have an organic mulch or whatever, there's not enough uh, nutrients going back to feed uh, the soil micro, uh, microbial uh, life. Of course, erosion, uh, this is a pretty uh, severely depleted soil. Another thing is when you get to, uh, uh, these are fertilizers that we're not gonna use in organic systems, but 10, 10, 10, and uh, this would be ammonium nitrate. Um, they not only go directly to the plant, completely bypass the microbiome, but they also further stimulate the breakdown of organic matter. And what, one of the things that's to remember is that prolonged fallow periods, especially if the soil is bare and it's unprotected, um, the organisms near the surface are subjected to the extremes of, of heat in the sun, freezing nights, uh, pounding rains, etc. But simply, even when you've got a little residue cover, there's no living plant cover to speak of here. So you don't have those daily inputs of um, goodies from plant roots. And that really makes uh, a big difference. These guys don't have enough to eat. Some of them can certainly feed on these residues, but the ones that really depend on the root zone uh, will be uh, dormant or actually dying out. Okay, so we'll look at some of the functions of uh, soil life and plant nutrients. Um, one of the functions, uh, we talked about uh, how they digest residues into soil organic matter and recycle nutrients. Uh, the organisms that do that, the decomposers uh, and the mixers, we've talked about all these different critters and how they physically mix everything together. Uh, providing nutrients for crops, this step happens with the grazers, those are the protozoa and the nematodes that are releasing the excess nutrients when they eat bacteria and fungi. And then these root symbionts, these are very important, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, and <clears throat> also, all of this activity maintains the aggregation or tilth and the drainage of the soil. Uh, bacterial release glues that tend to hold soil particles together. Fungi form these massive uh, networks of hyphae, which physically tie uh, soil particles together. Uh, plant roots also contribute directly towards creating channels, uh, drainage channels, and of course the earthworms as well. And when the soil has a good structure and a good pore network, then it can hold and deliver moisture and remain aerated as well so that they, uh, there's enough air and water. And then uh, protection of water quality, that's basically about making sure that nutrients are kept in the soil profile. Uh, these initial decomposers, when they tie up the nutrients uh, back in the 20th century, uh, a lot of extension agents said, warned organic growers, yeah, you put that organic stuff in the soil, it's gonna tie up all your nitrogen. Um, and that's actually in some cases true, but for the most part, it's a benefit because keeping it from going to the groundwater, you're holding it. And then of course the plant new roots, if you got roots down six feet utilizing nutrients, you're gonna greatly reduce leaching. So it's a two-way exchange. The plants are donating up to 30% of the micro, uh, their photosynthetic product goes right into their symbionts and the rhizosphere microbiome. In return, they are helping the plants get what they need to live. So this is a diagram based on uh, one that I saw in uh, Ray Wiles' uh, latest edition of Nature and Property of Soils, but it just, What's fascinating is not only do you have these organisms in the rhizosphere, like this bloom of bacteria near the root, you've got a bunch of them living on the root and inside. Now, most of these inside, these endophytes are harmless to beneficial. They don't eat the cells or anything like that. They're just wanting to get first in line for those root exudates. And while they're there, they often do the plant a number of favors, like helping with nutrient uptake, um, some of them are actually fixing nitrogen. Of course, that's true of the legumes, which uh, form the rhizomium for the nodules. Most of our crop plants, about 70% of our crop plants, form these very important associations with um, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And they're called arbuscular because if you look, uh, I've kind of exaggerated the scale here, but at a microscopic scale, you see these little tree-like structures where the membrane of the fungus comes right up against the cell membrane of the plant. And that's basically the trading post. The plant is just mainlining its goodies right to the fungus, which gives this fungus a tremendous advantage. It doesn't have to fight with all these other soil critters for 
crop residues and manure and all the other organic goodies floating in the soil, it's right there. Uh, these blue arrows, by the way, are the plant's photosynthetic product, how it goes directly to the mycorrhizae, to their endophyte um, symbionts, and right out into the soil to feed the rhizosphere. Um, the green is uh, all the soil life. And then the red is how plant nutrients get returned to the plant in this process. Of course, directly through the mycorrhizal network, uh, nitrogen fixation, which I don't show here. But also, when you got these protozoa like this amoeba or this bacteria feeding nematode chowing down on the bacteria and fungi, of course, that is releasing nutrients real close to the root. Well, one thing I wanted to mention that, although I didn't show any nodules there because that was not a leguminous root in that last slide, there are non uh, symbiotic but uh, rhizosphere zone, I mean, they're non, non endophytic, but they're symbiotic in that they are fixing nitrogen near the plant so they can take it up uh, organisms such as Azospirilla, Mesodobacter, uh, a couple of others. Anyway, uh, recent research has indicated there's a very interesting four way symbiosis. Mycorrhizal fungi, both ecto and arbuscular, have an amazing ability to create networks among plants, like a single mycelium will collect connect dozens or hundreds of plants and often plants of different species. Uh, there's uh, been individual mycorrhi I mean, uh, yeah, mycorrhizal uh, mycelia in forest ecosystems documented to occupy more than an acre and to be more than a thousand years old. And in a pasture, you may not get something quite so spectacular, but you also have, if you got your, your grasses, you got your legumes, there are both, um, they're both fixing uh, carbon from the atmosphere, feeding themselves for their own growth, but also feeding their microbiome. Uh, the legume is supporting its legume, uh, its uh, rhizobial symbiont. The grass is, uh, well, both of them are supporting mycorrhizal fungi, but the grasses have a much more extensive root system and the mycorrhizal mass may be larger. So they may be more efficient at taking out phosphorus. And there's evidence that the grass helps the legume by shipping phosphorus and the legume helps the grass by shipping nitrogen through the mycorrhizae. So how does soil life help with plant available moisture? Simply by improving the soil's physical properties, you're, ex you're enhancing infiltration of moisture and yet you're increasing the capacity to hold moisture because the bulk density is down, the total pore space is up, the excess drains out so everything can still breathe. And when you have a good structure like this, the plants will make deep extensive root systems so they can utilize the moisture effectively. So how does soil life act around plant pathogens and pests? Uh, well, uh, some of the, having a big uh, active uh, population of beneficial and harmless microbes, basically you crowd them out. And some of these guys, as I mentioned earlier, are consuming or parasitizing the pathogens or they're releasing antibiotics. Um, some of them suppress plant pests, the predatory nematodes. There are some fungal parasites like metarrhizium that attacks uh, insect larvae. Uh, they're entomopathogenic nematodes, which I mentioned already. Um, and some of these organisms, especially some of the endophytes, and this has been documented extensively in carrot, uh, they induce a resistance to plant disease throughout the plant. So these root micro um, microbial symbionts, not just warding off root rots, but they're also protecting the foliage from blights. Uh, carrots uh, showed increased resistance to leaf blight uh, caused by an alternaria. Um, and tomatoes uh, even showed increased resistance to the dreaded late blight, which can wipe out a whole field overnight practically. And of course, as reducing of animal and human pathogens, the dung beetles and decomposers that uh, help dispose of manure. <clears throat> so how does this work? You got the plant disease triangle. You've all been probably learned this. And uh, those of you who ever took a plant pathology class, you get a virulent pathogen, a susceptible host, a conducive environment, and you get a high risk of disease. Conducive environment often consists of very wet soil that's got restricted oxygen levels. A lot of the plant pathogens thrive in that circumstance. Uh, and if the pathogen is present and you've you got a susceptible variety, you're gonna, you're gonna get the disease. But healthy soil breaks us in a number of ways. Simply by draining quickly, you're making the climate a little less conducive. Uh, the environment less conducive to the pathogen. 
Also, if you've got an actively beneficial soil microbiome, um, the pathogen itself can be attacked directly. You got predator nematodes, you got parasitic fungi taking it out. You have the induced systemic resistance, so the, the host is not as uh, susceptible. And then, of course, one of the most important soil health practices is a good crop rotation. So you're susceptible to hosts only there one year out of three, and because of your good soil microbiome, it is not as susceptible because of uh, induced resistance and protection by these natural enemies. Okay, organic practices. Oh boy, I'm running out of time. So um, I think that uh, you get an idea of what the organic practices are gonna be from what we've seen so far. Um, all the other organic practices for building soil health that I've mentioned before, uh, play a very important role here. And do we look at the f uh, four principles of soil health? Keeping the soil covered, as I mentioned, that will that helps protect the soil microbiome. Uh, those constant presence of living roots that keeps them fed. The diversity of the cropping system, whether you have it through crop rotation or mixed cropping or multi-species cover crops, all of that enhances the diversity of the biome and therefore builds up the um, likelihood that you're going to meet all of the major functions that we were discussing before because you have a complete soil food web. Minimizing disturbance. Now these first three uh, practices are pretty much codified in the organic standards where they say you need to have a diverse uh, uh, soil, you need to have a diverse crop rotation and really good, take good care of your soil. This is challenging for all farmers because an agricultural ecosystem where you're growing crops is going to be inherently somewhat disturbed. Uh, it's not going to look like uh, the natural soil ecosystem under a forest or a prairie. You got to do some tillage to get your annual crops in. Uh, you, ne you need to protect your crop from weeds and pests and diseases. And in conventional agriculture, that's done with chemicals. Uh, organic producers use a very restricted list of mostly natural materials and therefore depend a little more on tillage. Um, the interesting thing is the, these chemicals, the, um, the herbicides, even the herbicides, which, don't, which have the least effect, direct effect on the soil microbiome, they've been shown to reduce uh, mycorrhizal activity. And if you have a lot of soluble nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, it definitely depresses the activity of the soil biota, and it reduces the soil's capacity to cycle nutrients and provide them to the crop the way I was showing. Invasive species like uh, spotted knapweed is one example. Another one is the, uh, the garlic mustard. A lot of invasive plants are that way because they alter the soil microbiome or even release substances in their root zone that are inhibitory or toxic to the native soil microbiota. That's one thing I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, in addition to food, roots exude specific chemicals that signal certain microbes to come join them, that, that they, the plants can recruit the most beneficial organisms to them. But if you have an invasive exotic, it can also send out uh, substances that the local microbiome just, just cannot handle. So a couple more principles for building soil food webs. You will integrate crops and livestock. Um, rotational grazing, uh, which could be done either on permanent pasture or on the pasture phase of a crop rotation or even the cover crop phase you know, of an annual rotation. When you do that flash grazing and then take the animals off, what happens is the uh, sod uh, releases a lot of root exudates or there's a, there's a flush of root sloughing that happens when those animals feed on the uh, plants. And then you take the animals off long enough for the crop to fully recover. So you're doing the best possible combination of uh, causing flushes of nutrients into the soil and allowing that uh, long-term cover to, re to uh, regenerate. And that is one of the most uh, effective ways to build soil organic matter, and there's also very high biological activity. Um, this is that law of return, organic waste. Uh, there is a caveat about composting, that if you're taking materials from one acre, you know, you're taking uh, manure and hay from one farm to make compost for your little vegetable farm, 
you are depleting nutrients on the other farm. However, this society is full of waste, leaves, uh, municipal leaves, yard waste, food waste. They shouldn't be going to the landfill. They all turn to methane there. You put them on the land, they become microbial food. Half of them becomes carbon dioxide. The other half, though, becomes long-term organic matter. So all of these, uh, it was estimated that there's like some like 60 million tons a year of uh, municipal leaves get thrown into the landfill and they should be going back on the land. Um, this is an example of a compost made out of food waste from a nearby university and yard waste from um, you know, individual you know, private lands. And uh, I just wanted to say before we go any further, uh, Practices that are covered in the eight um, guides that have been published so far will generally improve both the uh, abundance and the function and the biodiversity of your soil food web. There will be a ninth one coming out if I ever get around to it on soil life and soil health. Uh, so there's some challenges. How do you, uh, in uh, doing this fine tuning, one is how do you monitor soil life when most of it you can't see? I mean, uh, most of us probably can't even pick out a nematode, much less a bacterium. Then the sheer complexity makes it difficult to predict what will be the impact of a given practice, particularly of a purchased input. Um, and then you wanna ask yourself, well, what does beneficial mean? This is, it's always context specific, for example, uh, those earthworms that are the excellent ecosystem engineers and, and they just make cropland so fertile and so easy to, to work with. If they, if some of these um, European exotic earthworms invade American boreal forests, they will actually upset or even destroy the ecosystem because they consume all that surface litter that forest ecosystems typically have. And when that's gone, it totally changes the microbiome, it totally changes the nutrient cycling and the trees can no longer thrive. Um, a much less extreme example, uh, there are some crops and fortunately quite a few weeds as well for which these wonderful mycorrhizal fungi are actually mildly parasitic. Mycorrhizal fungus grows into a buckwheat or a spinach root, it freeloads some of its nutrients, but it, the, those particular plant families don't effectively form those arbuscules, uh, those, uh, trading posts for the microbes. So as a result, um, the plant doesn't really get anything back. Um, and plants don't tend to really invite the organisms that aren't gonna give them anything. So um, the brassica family, which also is non-mycorrhizal, they go a step further. They put out uh, glucosinolates that turn to isothiocyanates that kind of flip off all the fungi. They're pretty good at cleaning up some of the damping off organisms, but they'll put your mycorrhizae out of business for a few months. And so another big challenge is climate change. It will affect soil life. We know that there are shifts in the soil microbiome as, as the weather changes, extreme rains, droughts, uh, higher temperatures, uh, it's a big unknown. Okay, for organic farmers, we all depend as organic farmers, if we're going any um, uh, annual crops, we're gonna need to use some tillage because we're not gonna use herbicides to kill the weeds in the cover crop. Fortunately, it's not all or none. Um, some will have you believe that if you till once a year, you're gonna destroy your soil microbiome. It's not true, um, especially if you select your tillage implement with care. This is a blade plow. It's excellent for low rainfall regions for terminating residue, uh, cover crops and uh, killing weeds, preparing the land for the next crop and the rotation. The cool thing about this is it's a monster blade, but it only works a couple inches deep. So you're disturbing the surface of the soil just enough to knock out all the root crowns of the weeds and the cover crop you want to terminate, leaves all those residues on the surface and leaves most of the soil profile undisturbed. Phosphorus excesses from using manure and compost to, uh, as your sources of nitrogen and uh, other nutrients and organic matter very often build up an excess of phosphorus. As phosphorus levels increase, mycorrhizal activity tends to decrease. And remember the central importance of the mycorrhizal fungi in soil food web function. So the, the, the uh, answer is to use compost in moderation. And there's a lot of studies that show that you only need a little bit of compost to get that boost in uh, soil organic matter stability. And when you use it in combination with the cover crops and the other uh, uh, soil building practices, 
Uh, modern cultivars, this is very interesting. There's some evidence that a lot of our modern cultivars bred in the context of high input conventional systems have lost some of their capacity to partner with soil microbes. And this is another big one. There's, you look, open up any catalog of, of input products for organic growers, and there'll be dozens of soil inoculants, biostimulants, biofertilizers, soil conditioners, and they all have these big promises of how much uh, can you uh, use, how, mu how much benefit can you really expect out of this? Uh, and they often make very sweeping claims that'll just cure everything that's wrong with your farm, you know, with, with, with your crop. So this is a really interesting one. There's more and more evidence that a lot of modern cultivars are much less effective at partnering with both um, mycorrhizal fungi and other symbionts that improve nutrient and water uptake and also reduce their capacity to, to uh, call in or partner with natural enemies of pests and diseases. And What's the good news is that now that they're starting to uh, breed um, crop cultivars in organic and sustainable systems, some of this capacity is already beginning to return. So that's uh, really important. So what do you do? Here's the smorgasbord, I call it the smorgasbord of microbial products. Rhizobium legume, uh, seed inoculants, uh, these are recommended especially when your soil has not been planted in that particular legume in recent years. And it's a very specific organism and plant that's, uh, that you partner with and you inoculate the seed. So this is very often, and this is one of the least expensive microbial products out there. So it's what I call cheap insurance. Um, there are a lot of mycorrhizal fungal um, uh, materials that are being offered or biodynamic preparations that you've been around a long time, various compost teas, worm casting teas, uh, that's basically um, extracting and perhaps amping up the microbiome in the compost or the worm casting themselves. There's other products, effective microorganisms, Bokashi, various proprietary blends. And then there's uh, biofungicides or natural enemies of plant pathogens. And then there's some materials which are not microbial themselves, but are thought to feed the desirable organisms. Fungal foods or seaweed extracts or seaweed uh, uh, products, fulvic acids, uh, it's a form of um, extracted organic matter that becomes a, um, a humic substance. Uh, and then bacterial foods, typically the really easily stuff that you and I can eat as well, amino acids, uh, sugars, molasses, et cetera. So what you want to think about when you're deciding on inputs and management practices is what does each of these elements do for the soil biotic community? In order to have a community, you need to have the organisms, you need food, you need habitat, you need, and you need water and air supply, just like a human city. You need people, you need something for us to eat, you need for us a plus, uh, place for us to stay out of the rain, and we need our air and water. So plant roots, they're providing food all the time and they're an excellent habitat. Plant residues, when they're really green, they need to be bacterial food. Dry residues are fungal food and they can be habitat to some extent because they persist. Manure uh, provides some organisms and of course, uh, readily available uh, microbial foods. Finished compost is more of an inoculant and a habitat because a lot of already stabilized organic matter, not much food left in them. Organic fertilizers, uh, the concentrated things like feather meal and um, uh, poultry litter, pelleted poultry litter, they are useful when you need some concentrated nutrients for your crop, and they are permitted under organic standards because they're kinder to the soil than 10-10-10 or other soluble fertilizers. However, they don't do much for the soil biotic community per se. They provide a little bit of food, perhaps. Biochar and humates, they're all the rage. Um, and they can be very useful. Just keep in mind, they are habitat. Uh, they're not gonna be full of organisms unless they've been pre-inoculated and they're not gonna be food. In fact, if you put on just biochar, you can actually have a slight depression in crop growth because it's tying up nutrients. Compost tea is mostly organisms. So do we need to introduce uh, microbes in order to restore the soil? Here's an example. This is out in uh, uh, North Dakota. Gabe Brown, he wrote an excellent book. I recommend it to all of you, Dirt to Soil. Um, 
and it was just published this past year. And he said there'll be still be some small bit of life in the soil, even if the soil has really been tilled to death or had a lot of chemicals into it. And you don't have to just give it a chance to grow. He took 5,000 acres of depleted land, and I mean depleted. It was down to 2% organic matter uh, versus a native level of about 8%. Took 5,000 acres, grew crops according to the four NRCS principles, added the fifth principle of integrating the livestock and rotational grazing. And um, in 20 years, that organic matter jumped to 7%. And we can only imagine the way that the soil microbiome bloomed. Because remember, you won't get this soil organic matter without the microbiome. He never put a single purchased inoculant on there. He may have made a little compost and put it on, but it wasn't even mentioned in the book. So, um, and you're not going to put five tons per acre of compost on 5,000 acres and stay in business. It's not gonna happen. Well, do commercial inoculants work? We've had mixed results. Uh, if the soil is already quite fertile, they don't tend to do very much. Uh, and that's because most of the functions that are served by those um, inoculants is um, already there. Now on soils that are low in fertility, uh, they can be quite beneficial. And in fact, with kind of some of the research indicates that we're at a moderately low fertility level. Like for example, let's take a Southeastern US soil. It's in the order called altosols, highly weathered, a lot of its nutrient reserves are down in the subsoil. A lot of its clays are in the subsoil. Uh, there's biological activity in the top soil, but you don't tend to accumulate a lot of organic matter because the weather is warm and a lot of our soils are sandy. Um, in this circumstance of soil of average health, uh, you can expect a pretty good response to, a, to any of these microbial inoculants that have good science behind them. There's some that are just, you know, not that effective or not really backed by the evidence, but you get a good um, uh, material, you can get a good response. Now, why might some of these fail even here in the South? They might be outcompeted by the indigenous soil biota. Uh, usually it will happen either when you have a very active and balanced soil food web, or if you just turn under a bunch of green matter with a, with a rototiller and you get a huge bacterial bloom, and then you try to spray if, you know, a few hundred thousand microbes per acre or something that you want, they're going to get squeezed out. Or as I mentioned before, their intended functions are already provided by your existing biota and your practices. Sometimes there's something in your existing biota that will attack what you put on one way or another, parasitize it, eat it for lunch, um, or just suppress it with uh, antibiotics. And sometimes you don't have very good product that's lost via viability. Be real careful how you handle it from the moment you buy it to the moment you use it because a little bit of too much sunlight or heat or freezing can uh, kill it. So there's some research findings around this interesting question. There was one uh, project at Ohio State where uh, the research team coordinated and they even set up a, a, a website, a network with farmers and they tried this on 21 on-farm sites in seven states, tried 13 different products, all of them well-researched, most of them consisting of several organisms, um, often including a mycorrhizal fungus, um, beneficial bacteria. They tried on seven different vegetable crops. There was not one trial that showed a benefit in two years. And I kind of look at that and then I thought, well, maybe these things aren't needed. But then I ran into other analyses. It was a meta-analysis worldwide, about 134 different research reports, including over 1,000 individual comparisons of crops that received a mycorrhizal inoculant versus ones that were not inoculated. And these crops were generally phosphorus. Uh, these these trials on average showed a 50% response. Now, some of these are greenhouse trials, some were in the field, well, most of them were in the field, uh, different crops, but all over the world, a lot of lower fertility soils. Basically, whenever the crops were found, were known or thought to be phosphorus limited, you got more positive response. And there were a few trials that showed up to a 30% depression in crop growth or yield by this inoculant. It was freeloading and it wasn't really benefiting the crop very much. Uh, many factors could be responsible for that too. Also in the greenhouse and gross chamber trials, the mycorrhizae worked a lot better when other soil biota were present than when they were added to a sterile system. 
So um, humic substances, um, these are interesting because we used to think, uh, scientists used to think that sta uh, stable organic matter consisted of these macromolecules called humus, uh, humans, humic acid, and fulvic acids. Turns out that's mostly an artifact of the alkaline extraction to determine soil organic matter. And yet, those artifacts turn out to be pretty decent soil conditioners. So they're sold as humates or humic acids or fulvic acids. And there was one trial in Brazil where they tried a nitrogen fixing endophyte, not a, not a non performer, but just a nitrogen fixing endophyte on corn. Either of these alone increased corn yield by 20%. Together, they synergized, increased it by 65%. And then in a, a very saline soil in Northern China, a very cold, temperate, very difficult environment to grow corn, trichoderma, which as uh, we saw earlier as an important biofungicide, also directly improved soil quality, ameliorated some of the effects of the salinity and the corn yield didn't go up dramatically, but it went up about 10%. The interesting thing to me is when I look at this is that these organic farmers in Ohio probably already had really fertile soil. Either they built it up to optimal state or maybe overdid the phosphorus with their comp compost. So they were least likely to get benefit. This was a worldwide meta-analysis. So many of the trials were done in the tropics or in warm temperate zones where the soils are less fertile and really benefit. Um, and these also, like in Brazil, that was an altasol, uh, again, the very highly weathered soil. And this was in a, also in a very difficult environment and a, a low fertility soil. So a few tips for using these um, critters. You wanna clarify your goals. What are you using it for? And then you might wanna say, well, do I really need that or do my current soil conditions meet this need already? Research your products carefully. And then you wanna conduct trials side by side. Uh, before you invest in a compost tea for a 20 acre vegetable operation, you might wanna take half a dozen beds, spray beds one, three, and five, let two, four, and six sit there. Or if you wanna be absolutely scientific about it, you flip a coin, decide which of each pair gets the stuff, but you spray it on some of it and you leave some of it unsprayed or whether it's inoculated in the soil, however you do it. And see if you get a response. And if you don't get a yield response, look at the soil. Does the soil look in better condition? Does it crust less? Uh, does it look a little darker? Does, or did there were, was there less evidence of disease? And then you try it again for a couple of years and then decide, okay, well, that's really worth it. And then again, I mentioned this before, it's really important to store and handle it very carefully uh, as it's a living product. It's not just like, you know, well, humates, you don't have to be so careful of it, it's just a substance, but you definitely want to handle this as a living product. Um, if you got plant symbionts, you definitely want to put it right on the seeds or the roots. If you take something like a mycorrhizal fungus and spray it, you know, broadcast over the field, you're wasting 90% of it. Either going to team up with mycorrhizal weeds or get eaten by the soil biota or go dormant before it can find your, your plant. You want to put it right on your crop. Uh, and if you are doing a whole field treatment for something that's going to have a more general effect on the soil microbiome and you do want to apply it to the whole field like a biodynamic preparation, uh, do it in the evening or on a nice mild cloudy day or just before a gentle rain or just when you're getting ready to irrigate because that'll bring those organisms into the soil before the sun burns them up. Um, you can also encourage the mycorrhizal fungi in your own soil. Uh, grass cover crops are really excellent symbionts uh, like pearl millet and oats. Also all the legume cover crops. But the most important thing is to maintain those living roots and avoid prolonged fallow. As long as you have roots of mycorrhizal host crops there, the mycorrhizal will stay active. Now they can go dormant and survive for a while for a long cold winter, they'll survive the freeze. If you plant one round of broccoli and you got, you know, got anti-mycorrhizal crops there for 90 days, they'll go to sleep in the spores, they'll still be there. But you don't want it too long without those desirable roots. You diversify your rotation, build up the diversity of the mycorrhizae, um, if you've grown those non-host crops, follow it with a grass legume cover crop and really uh, wake them up and get them going again for your next uh, host crop. Uh, the most, more you can reduce tillage intensity, the better. Um, a lot of evidence that not only mycorrhizal fungi, but the microbiome as a whole is much more tolerant of a fairly gentle non-inversion tillage, such as a rotary spader or a chisel plow than of the, a moldboard plow, which turns a house upside down. Also more tolerant of uh, something gentle like a rotary harrow. 
uh, or strict tillage or ridge tillage where you're just working up right in the crop row and leaving the inner rows undisturbed versus rototilling the whole field, which will just chop everything in bits. Uh, avoid these uh, nutrient surpluses. That's important for the whole soil microbiome. And then avoid soil applied fungicides. Well, we don't really have to talk to organic farmers about that, except well, yeah, once in a while, we got a really bad disease, we got to use copper or something. Just be aware that those fungicides, even biofungicides, will have some impact on these guys as well. Um, and Dr. David Dowds, uh, there's more information in, uh, in the notes. Uh, I, I did prepare about 20 pages of uh, presentation notes to give a lot more detail, but I couldn't cover today and I'm already over my time. Uh, but there is a way to propagate indigenous mycorrhizal fungi from the best soil on your farm and then uh, deliver to your host crops or to your less well endowed fields uh, using Bahia grass grown in container culture. You let the Bahia grass grow in winter kill and the mycorrhizae survive the freeze and then you have an inoculum. Uh, Dr. Doubts uh, developed that, it's in the notes. Okay, managing disease, I think we're gonna have to pretty much uh, fast forward to the end, but uh, just building the soil health and these pathogen antagonists, uh, which have been formulated into various uh, commercial products, they can be very valuable when used in conjunction with um, good crop rotation and good soil health uh, practices. Just by themselves, they're not gonna prevent disease, but they can be just about as effective as um, some of the uh, commercial fungicides. And here's a trick, more of modify the soil biota to suppress disease. Mustard seed meals and green manures. It was first thought that these mustard seed meals were acting as a biofumigant. Turns out that's not really what happens. The biofumigation effect lasts a few days. A commercial fumigant kills off all the pest uh, pathogens for about a year, then they come back gangbusters. But a mustard seed meal treatment suppresses pathogens for two or three years, as in the case of apple uh, replant disease, some studies by Mazzola and colleagues um, uh, a few years ago. What's happened is it's completely shifted the soil microbiome to be much more suppressive, increases the disease suppressive uh, microbial antagonists. Biosolarization and anaerobic soil disinfestation, uh, other approaches to doing this. Um, Dr. Carol Shannon, uh, uh, UC California, has uh, worked with growers. Uh, basically, this system combines adding an organic amendment and it's something that's readily digestible, something like rice hulls. You want something that, that their microbes are gonna feed on, not finished compost. Then you cover it, to, you water to saturation, you temporarily create an anaerobic condition. Now, I kind of talk that down as something that's very, very disease promoting, but in this, in this particular application, it seems to promote disease suppression. Cover it with mulch for three to six weeks, let that anaerobic activity digest all of that, create a huge bloom of microorganisms, and this very nasty strawberry pathogen is reduced by 80%, and the yield benefits have been enough that it's now widely adopted by organic and conventional farmers. Okay, so finally, summary. Um, you feed the soil with the living plant roots, diversify, uh, supplement with a little compost, don't overdo it so you don't get swamped with phosphorus and, and uh, other nutrients. Balanced input of carbon to nitrogen, uh, you limit your use of the concentrated fertilizers, uh, reduce tillage to the extent practical, and I think it's just as important to avoid the prolonged fallow, and these purchased inoculants, especially on your lower fertility soil. It's good for the building up phase. Okay. These are all the organizations that made it possible for OFRF to support me, Organic Farming Research Foundation to support me in doing this work and preparing this webinar. And all right, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I know we've got some questions in the queue and I just want to um, thank you for joining us today. Um, here we go. Um, we have one um, grower on here who's looking for a microbial product to spray on soil under peach trees to help combat leaf curl fungi. fungi. So um, he hasn't um, had good luck with copper spray during dormancy. That's not working for him. So do you have any suggestions for that? Leaf curl is a foliar disease. Uh, what to put on the soil? It would have to be something that's going to induce systemic resistance. Um, I am not familiar enough with orchard 
uh, dynamics. Uh, I do know that the trichoderma has multiple modes of action that include some in induced resistance. There are also pseudomonas bacteria, the fluorescent pseudomonas, uh, that have induced resistance in tomatoes and um, others. The first step, I think, is to keep the orchard floor covered in a living cover and, you know, just manage it by mowing so it doesn't out, you know, doesn't put uh, competitive pressure on the trees. Um, very interesting question. I would say, look up the Mark Mazzola. I think he's a, um, he's a USDA somewhere out in the Pacific Northwest. I, I, unfortunately, I can't pull up exactly where he is um, in my mind, my memory right now, but uh, he's done a lot of work with this mustard seed meals, but I think they mostly induce these uh, direct antagonists like the streptomyces, um, the antibiotics and, and some of the parasitic fungi. Uh, but I think in order to modify the soil to suppress peach leaf curl, you'll want to look at uh, inducing systemic resistance. And remember, um, there's a huge difference in soil health between a bare so orchard floor that's either tilled or uh, herbicide controlled versus anything where you've got living cover, cover, either a series of annual cover crops that are terminated uh, to minimize competition for moisture, or better yet, even at least the alleys in a perennial cover. Because when you have the soil microbiome fed and happy, it's more likely that there'll be some critter in there that's gonna enter the peach roots, partner with them and help just strengthen the plant overall. But I do not know much about peach leaf curl, except that I know it's a terrible disease. Okay. Um, let's see. You um, were talking about the book by um, Gabe Brown, and um, it said that you described Brown's depleted land as 2% organic matter, and crop science, um, let's see, I'm just, it's switched off here. Okay, here we go. Crop scientists at Virginia Tech um, have said that East Coast soils can be typically 1% to 2% organic matter, um, and they've also said that bringing the soil organic matter to 5% is not realistic. Um, what's your perspective about that? Uh, first, let me say that Virginia Tech itself has rated my soil at 5%, and all I did with it, all we did with it here at the community was to break the sod and then garden it reasonably sustainably with occasional heavy cover crop. So a good Appalachian soil will be 5%, but there's also a lot of context. If you're talking about a coastal plain soil, 2% is excellent health. If you're talking about a prairie soil in North Dakota, where half of the year the soil is frozen and the other half of the year you get 16 inches of moisture in which to grow grasses, 8% is the steady state. If you go into a longleaf pine forest, you'll find a good duff layer on the surface with all those um, uh, microarthropods turning it over, but you get down three or four inches, into it, you'll be down to 2% in a hurry in a native ecosystem here in coastal Virginia. So it's totally context specific. Um, somebody had to really commit mayhem on that soil to get it down to 2% up in North Dakota. I don't know how it happened, but I mean, as uh, Gabe Brown said, the organisms were just sort of biding their time until he came along and said, well, NRCS has shown me something. I know where to start. And the interesting thing is he actually had three years of crop failures between the fact that the soil was depleted and the fact that he lucked out, I mean, he had bad luck in terms of really bad hailstorms. And then, although he almost went out of business, he hung in there and the end of four years of growing crops and having them hailed into the ground and growing cover crops and never leaving the soil bare and starting to rotate his cow, cattle through there, he suddenly started to see the soil get darker. He started to see earthworms. He started to see evidence of uh, fertility coming back. And so he just, uh, I mean, he, he did accomplish a lot, getting it to 7%. If you're at 85% of the native level, which is that, what that represents, that is better than most well-managed agricultural ecosystems. But um, the 8%, 7% and 8% is highly realistic up there. Uh, and anybody who does rotational grazing, I mean, if, you just, if you're just doing ranching, if you're just doing range, um, and you got that kind of moisture level of you know 15, 20 inches a year, and uh, you manage the the uh, cattle well, it'll get to eight percent in 20, 30 years, no no problem. 
Okay. Um, do you know of any evidence that mustard cover crops provide antifungal benefits similar to the use of mustard seed meal additives? Interesting. Um, there are a lot of, yeah, a lot of studies been done with mustard green manures. In fact, there was one in uh, Maine. I, I, it was, um, I didn't really include it in the details of this particular presentation, but they were looking at organic potatoes grown with compost or with a uh, crucifer family cover crop. I can't remember if it was mustard or canola or what, but uh, one of those or both. And what they found is that the compost tended to build total organic matter and the mustard tended to suppress diseases. It prevented there was a certain disease in the potato, I can't remember what it was, but it was much less with the mustard. So, um, and also in high tunnels, uh, they have done biofumigation where you chop the mustard, turn it under, you know, very similar to that and then water it really heavily and get the heck out of there because the mustard oil is pretty asphyxiating. And I think what happens, you get that very brief fumigation effect, and then you get a longer impact on the soil microbiome that faces the antagonists. Um, there are a lot of factors here. It won't be exactly the same as a seed meal, but there will be some similar effects. Okay. Um, do you know of anything that might help the soil or help the plants against virus-infected thrips in tomatoes? Ooh, yeah, tomato spotted wilt virus. Oh, that's a good one. Let me think about that. The main control tactic there is the winter weeds. There are a lot of winter annual weeds that harbor that thrips. Um, um, I just wanted to say if anybody else has any ideas, um, feel free to type them into the chat box and copy. Like there's a little drop down next to like where you um, where it says to who the message goes, and you can check all panelists and all attendees. So feel free to chime in with any knowledge about this that you might have, and remember to um, copy all the attendees. So um, we had one comment here regarding mustard. Uh, we'll go back to the thrips in a second. Um, this person said, Must much of the western side of California has extensive mustard due to the missionaries who dropped mustard seeds as they were traveling. Okay, that's an interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you could uh, feel free to chime in as well. So did you want to say anything more about um, thrips there, Mark? Or should we um, Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, research were to discover something that increases a tomato's systemic resistance, whether to the virus or to the thrips. Um, there won't be a direct, I mean, a, a, a soil a soil-borne uh, predator or parasite is probably not going to get directly on the thrips. Um, there may be ground beetles that come up out of the soil. If you have a good mulch and you have low levels of disturbance, uh, the ground beetles may come up and consume some of the thrips and help keep the, the vectoring down. Uh, that is a serious problem, and I think it's a matter of winter weed control. And one way to control winter weeds is to grow a winter cover crop that doesn't host the thrips. That'll take a little research, but uh, if you have a non-host cover crop, you're building soil and by the way, uh, giving the thrips no place to overwinter. So you'll have le less of an issue with that particular virus. Okay, here's a good question. Um, what is the optimal time frame for growing and cutting tall grasses when you're trying to build soil? Should you do it every year, twice a year, every three years? mean grazing the cows on the grass? Um, it just says growing and cutting. So I'm, I'm, he may mean mowing um, tall grasses. Oh, just tall grass. He said cow yeah. grass. Okay. Yeah. Um, probably simulate uh, rotational grazing. You could cut them at early head. If you get them really, really old and then cut them, you may uh, you won't be returning as balanced a quality of uh, organic matter to the surface. Um, well, hay, you know, haying you usually do three times a year, uh, but if you're harvesting off all that hay, you're really depleting nutrients. I've seen a number of soils here where the organic matter is great and the tilth is great, but the P and the K are, you know, single digits, like you're really depleted. Um, so haying is tricky, but uh, the idea with the grazing is to grow the crop, grow the grass tall enough and mature enough that it has uh, really regenerated the, um, uh, its root system. 
the worst thing you can do for a grass hen is, is to keep it manicured like a lawn because the, you, when you mow the lawn every week or two, you don't have any chance, the, crop, the grass doesn't have any chance to regenerate and deepen its roots. You end up with this really shallow thatched root system. And at the opposite extreme, when you have optimally managed rotational grazing, now that can vary from every five or six weeks up to once or twice a year, depending upon your rainfall and your existing fertility, et cetera, a lot of factors season. During the winter, it won't go as much as during the summer, even here in the south. Uh, of course, in North Dakota, it's snow covered or frozen hard and you won't be growing anything during the winter. But um, the idea is uh, that, now the mowing does somewhat simulate the grazing, but it's not quite the same. Mowers don't tend to leave nutrient bitch dung. They don't tend to trample the larger, coarser stems back into the soil. Um, they just tend to knock everything down. So it is a different impact, but if you are wanting to grow and mow, I would just say mow infrequently, let the grass begin to head, then mow. Okay, um, let's see, this person is looking for sanfoin information. Um, does this deep-rooted perennial legume have some unique soil biota qualities which make it such a favorite for meadow enthusiasts? How might sanfoin improve the soil biotic community? Well, I don't know specific. The only specific I know about sanfoin is that it is a fairly heavy user of moisture. Uh, the pitfall with things like sanfoin and alfalfa is you go, wow, they're deep rooted, they're drought resistant, they're drought resilient. So they might be great to put in as the perennial phase of a crop rotation. But if you do that in a semi-arid region with 12 inches of rain, you can deplete the soil profile of moisture so badly that your next two wheat crops have depressed yield. However, having said that, every crop, every plant uh, favors a certain specific microbiome. And with the exception of these invasive exotics, most of them are gonna do something very beneficial. And there may be some specific things about sanfoin that support organisms that favor other plants and, and favor building up a diverse uh, prairie. I don't know. I don't know where sanfoin is even from. Okay. I know it's a legume, so it will be fixing nitrogen. It'll host uh, a certain rhizobium. Okay, um, this person is wondering about biochar. And he said, we've heard a lot about it for some time. And we've hoped that it was the key way for soil fertility and soil moisture management. Where are we today with um, biochar? Well, uh, where we are is it's a tool, uh, it's not a silver bullet. And one thing to be aware of, if, you want, if you're sustainability conscious, you wanna be conscious of where the biochar comes from. Uh, one of the things that's interesting to me about biochar is the idea originally came from these terra preta soils in uh, the Amazon. If you look in the Amazon, that's, that has a type of soil called oxisol, which is even more weathered and even less fertile than the ultisols. And are, if you, clear forest from a tropical rainforest oxisol and farm it uh, for corn, soybean, wheat rotation. Even if you have a uh, tight rotation or no fallow, you will kill that soil within three to five years. It'll just laterize, turn, it'll just turn to rock and lose all of its fertility because most of that fertility was tied up in the forest itself. It was a, a litter-based ecosystem rather than a you know, deep soil prairie type ecosystem. Now, there are these darker soils, about one or two percent of the entire area of the Amazon region has darker soils that are much more resilient to till agriculture or to uh, annual cropping agriculture. If they're, if they're managed well, you can farm them sustainably just like an Iowa silt loam. And the reason is, it turns out that these are areas where their Native American communities were living and they're the charcoal from their cooking fires plus uh, the dung actually their own night soil and the dung from the animals and all the food scraps and all the crop waste is all got thrown into these areas where they were growing their food and the charcoal stabilized the organic matter so instead of having one percent organic matter like a typical rainforest soil in brazil it might have five percent and so then the uh, research got a hold of this. And then it was later discovered that the reason our prairie soils out in Iowa, you know, the, the corn belt soils that are so famously rich and that, you know, they have eight, 10% organic matter. 
It turns out half of that organic carbon, half of the stable organic matter is what's called black carbon. It was originally derived from fire, very similar to biochar or terra preta uh, carbon. And the way it came about there is prairie fires. You know, I'm not talking about these horrible firestorms like consumed, you know, the campfire that consumed uh, uh, that town up in California and um, things like that. I'm talking about quick moving, not too intense fires that make everything look black, but don't kill the plants. They just kind of singe the crowns a little bit. And that little bit of uh, charred organic matter basically becomes in situ biochar. And I think that that's how uh, the soils in the Midwest got so black and so rich in organic matter. And that includes the North Dakota area where, where Gabe Brown is restoring the soil. I don't think he's using fire. And that makes me there's the possibility of, well, what if this practice called prescribed burning, which is actually a conservation practice that's cost shared by NRCS under the right circumstances, one of its benefits might be to create that stabilizing effect. Um, another detail about biochar is it was found if you let it mature for a while, you don't just take fresh biochar out of the, out of the pyrolysis chamber and throw it on the field. You let it age for a couple of years and there's some oxidation that goes on that increases its, its cation exchange capacity, makes it much more biologically active. And the other thing is remember, it's just the habitat, it's just the house. An empty house isn't gonna have much in it until you put the food in it and the water and, the, um, and then get the people to move in. And so some biochar manufacturers actually inoculate their biochar with microbes and a little bit of microbial food. Another way to do it is just to put it on either right when you're turning under a cover crop or, with, or put it in through your compost pile. Uh, so that's, anyway, got me going on biochar. <laughs> Okay, we've got one more question here. Um, besides Solvita paddle testing, is there any other way to test your soil for CO2 respiration? And are there any other studies done in Northern Ohio soil to get a type of baseline for soil respiration? Very good questions. Um, I think more work needs to be done. I do know that the Solvita soil biology activity test was the starting point for that potentially mineralizable carbon test. Um, it actually is a valid protocol, but if you do it for just one day, or if you do it with those paddles, I tried to play with those paddles once some, myself some time ago, and I had the hardest time reading because the color was not the same as, as on the chart. <clears throat> so that in itself, you know, it does have some issues. And one of them is the fact that when you do a 24 hour incubation, you get a lot more variability and a lot less reliable indication of your soil status than if you do a four-day incubation. And I think the four-day incubation is still a laboratory procedure, uh, but the thing about the, that one and even the uh, permanganate oxidizable carbon is they are not very complicated or expensive as lab procedures go. So there may not be too many more years before these will be available to farmers um, at reasonable cost, you know, a few dollars a sample, maybe $10 a sample, um, just the way a standard soil test is today. Uh, so that's, um, in fact, NRCS is coming out fairly soon with a technical note. Uh, the draft was out for uh, comment and I reviewed it and was very impressed, made a few minor comments. Um, I'm hoping they come out with it sometime this year, but it'll list six different soil health parameters and the lab procedures. One of them is the four day um, uh, potentially mineralizable carbon based on the Solvita soil respiration. Another one is the permanganate oxidizable carbon. And another one is an improved estimate of total soil organic matter. It's, it's called dry combustible, dry combustion, which rather than loss on ignition, and I'm not sure of the details, but somehow it's much more accurate in reflecting soil, soil organic matter. Uh, and then there's a couple of uh, tests for microbial community and uh, enzyme activities, which basically are really get down, uh, get you some pretty good detail on soil biological function. That so that's pretty great. exciting. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, I'm not saying the NRCS is gonna be able to make them available to farmers right away, but at least they'll have those protocols out there and that might be the basis for private labs to adopt those and then become certified as providing the service. I'm not sure exactly how it's gonna be used, but 
Um, anyway. Okay. That one. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all the questions. Thank you again, Mark, for this great sure. webinar. And um, we hope that everyone can join us for the other webinars in the Soil Health and Organic Farming in the Western States um, mm -hmm. series, which is kind of wrapping up in the next month or so. And um, if you just Google webinars by eOrganic, um, you'll be able to find out the information on how to register for those. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much.